We are back for another recap and rebuttals episode today on Solving JFK. We'll be summarizing the four-part series on Oswald and Russia, which I probably should have called Oswald and the Soviet Union, but I thought Russia sounded catchier. This is the seventh recap and rebuttals that we've done for Solving JFK. And before we get started, I want to just take a minute to say thank you to everyone who's listening to this. I know there are a lot of other podcasts, and even in the JFK world alone, there are many other excellent podcasts. So the success that we've had on Solving JFK is 100% due to everyone who's listening. And you know, when I think back on my last year in the, the JFK assassination world, it seems surreal. I, I got to be a talking head in a major documentary. I was asked to contribute to a book that hit number one on the Amazon chart for 1960s American history. And the podcast recently broke uh, the uh, 1 million downloads mark, which that's that's a big one for me. So I just want to say thanks for listening and for sharing the show with your friends. Your support means a lot and it energizes me to keep going, which is what I intend to do. Today, our special guest is Eric Hunley. Eric actually hosts four separate YouTube channels, including Unstructured, Laid Back Law, Pod Streaming, and one that's well known to a lot of Solving JFK listeners, America's Untold Stories with Eric and Mark Gruber. Coming up on Solving JFK. In Dallas, Texas, three shots were fired at President Kennedy's motorcade in downtown Dallas. The first reports say that President Kennedy has been seriously wounded by this shooting. The flash, apparently official, President Kennedy died at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time. This is Solving JFK. I'm your host, Matt Crumpton. Eric, welcome to Solving JFK. Thanks for coming on. Hey, good to be here, man. How you doing? Good, 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 good. Before we start talking about Oswald and the Soviet Union, I know you have several YouTube and podcast projects. How, how long have you been podcasting and kind of how did you get started in, in the different spaces that you're in? Because it is interesting to see someone that's got so many different uh, lanes. <laughs> uh, I started podcasting uh, 2018, actually March 15th, 2018. So we're coming into six years, I guess. And then I kind of got backed into doing a video podcast that wound up being a live stream by Chase Hughes of the Behavior Panel. This is pre-Behavior Panel, but he was like, dude, I want to do a video. And I said, Chase, I have a face for radio. <laughs> anyway, but he, he talked me into it. I, I did it with him. That one went really well. I was friends with other people like uh, Viva Fry. So he came on and then I found that I actually did better with YouTube than I did the podcast, which is very odd. Did that for a bit. Then um, uh, my show actually got ripped off of YouTube temporarily due to an error. When it came back on, there's a smart ass on the internet who was saying, hey, not for nothing there, Hunley, but your first guests are uh, an FBI spook and a KGB spook, et cetera. You think you're not asking for trouble. That guy was this um, weird account named Lord Buckley. <laughs> and um, we wound up started talking on the side and he came on and that ultimately turned into America's untold stories. You and Mark have a lot of episodes on the JFK assassination and you've got a great one that's an hour and a half on Oswald and the Soviet Union. I think you focus on his time in Minsk a lot, a lot of stuff about Ernst Titovitz. Well, it's actually about Titovitz more than Yet. it on right. uh, or, uh, more than it is on Oswald. We also have one on Webster, but we haven't done Oswald in uh, Soviet Union or Russia or whatever you want. We did Oswald in Japan. We haven't got oh, right. that yet. We're going to kind of like you're doing. It appears, I guess, great ideas. We're 
stripping <laughs> Oswald into chunks. Right. Because there's so much to a story. And Mark, you know, hopefully we can work something out. But Mark literally is the Oswald guy. He wrote okay. a five-part miniseries on Oswald with um, Oliver Stone's um, very gracious and sometimes intimidating input. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. But yeah, you've got the the Tidbits episode and the Robert Webster episode. So those are exactly uh, dialed into what we'll be talking about today. So far in season two on solving JFK, we've covered Oswald growing up and we've covered Oswald in the Marines. And we did cover him in, in Japan in that context as well. And both of those series just gives us background information on Oswald. And the thing that we keep coming across, Eric, is that there are these multiple instances of Oswald being documented in two places at the same time, okay? And uh, and this keeps coming up. Now, that could mean that he was being impersonated, a la the, the Harvey and Lee theory, or it could just mean that there's a false paper trail that's being created, which is what a lot of other people think. Uh, but the fact that there are these numerous documentary uh, discrepancies, that's really indisputable, and, and we've, we've covered it in depth. So there's something going on. We just... I don't know that we've figured out exactly what what it is, but there is something. So as we look at Oswald's time in the Soviet Union, the big question that we're trying to ask is, is why did he go there? And is it really plausible that he just went on his own? That's the big question. So let's get into it. The first big issue is how did Oswald arrive in Helsinki? So there's no record of his arrival in the country of Finland. Uh, we have just last year a Finnish intelligence agency report that was declassified saying that the Finnish intelligence agency thinks Oswald entered through Sweden and not from London. There was a flight that arrived from London to Helsinki at 1133 on the same night that Oswald supposedly arrived at midnight. And there's a whole CIA memo saying, well, he couldn't have been on that flight because uh, you know, he would have had to go through customs and he'd have to take a, a cab to get there. So, it's, you know, he'll <laughs> arrive closer to 1230 or one. It's like pretty close, <laughs> you know, 1133, 12. So to me, that's not, you know, this is an issue that's it comes up in the literature is like there's all these facts on this side and there's all these facts on this other side. But I don't think it ends up being super important in terms of like how he arrived in Helsinki. Um, we just know that, that he he got there. Right. So. The bigger question is, uh, it, but I will say to me, I think it's the most likely that he came in on that 1133 flight and the person at the hotel probably just put midnight when it was, you know, 1230 or one, just, you know, to make sure that, that he was charged for it. I'm speculating to an extent, but that's that's kind of what I would surmise. Well, it's a can, manifest for the flight. For the flight, there, there's no, uh, no, there's, there's, he, he's not on the flight list and he's not on, he's not on the, uh, there, there's no documentation of him arriving in Finland, but what we what we have wow. is you see this is where it, it, this <laughs> is where the the story I think gets weird because yeah. like why why is his name not there I mean it's just a flight it's a flight he announced he's going everybody knows he's going so why is there a problem with his name showing up why does he not have a stamp in Sweden which you also covered. And then, of course, the biggest factor that you covered was why Helsinki. Right, right. So then we we look at the the two hotels he, he stays at. So he, he gets there to Helsinki. He checks into Hotel Turney, which is the fanciest hotel in the entire country. And it used to be the headquarters for the uh, British intelligence and also for the Russian spies at the end of World War II. And then, so he stayed there for two nights. And then he moved to a different hotel that was three blocks down the street that was the second fanciest hotel in uh, Helsinki called the Klaus Kirky. And he uh, he travels on deluxe trains the, the whole time that he's in the in uh, the USSR. He gets like the fanciest, uh, you know, reservation to to do his uh, his touring the USSR with uh, in tourist. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, he goes and he stays at this you know hotel metropole in, in Moscow for for months. So you can argue that he would have had enough money to pay for the flight to Finland and maybe for the fancy hotel rooms, but then he's got to get to Russia. He's got to pay for the deluxe travel, you know, then he's at Hotel Metropole for all this time. So what do you think about Oswald's financial ability, wherewithal to do what 
what he apparently did on paper. Um, I will throw out a complete wild card speculation of which I have zero facts, but it just popped in my head. He shared the same travel agent with Clay Shaw. Yes. What do travel agents typically do, especially with an extremely high roller like Clay Shaw? I think we'd all agree Clay Shaw is quite wealthy, quite connected, world traveler. Um, is it not possible that this could have been paid for by Clay Shaw? And it could just be a typical trip that Clay Shaw might have taken. He would be at a certain level of hotel, certain level of transportation, whatever it is. Do you have any proof of Oswald even paying for any of this? No, we don't have. We have proof of him paying for the uh, the Marion Likens uh, freighter that took him uh, from New Orleans to France. That's all we have. Okay. So we have we have the receipt, which is which is admittedly from uh, the 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 travel agent <laughs> that's that's Clay Shaw's agent. We have not done a deep dive on on Clay Shaw, uh, allegedly, aka Clay Bertrand, yet on solving JFK. But we will, and uh, obviously, you know, people who study this topic aren't you know it's not like they're siphoned off. They have they you know people are aware of who Clay Shaw is. He's Tommy Lee Jones from uh, from from JFK. Uh, the Oliver Stone film, but yeah, I think I think that's absolutely uh, possible. And and the question is, it, it would have to be something like that. Somebody set him up, you know. And who would it be? It probably wouldn't be like the CIA with the CIA.gov credit card, right? It would probably be some manner of cutout if that's what was happening. And that would be very easy to do because he did, in fact, use the same travel agent. So also, the ticket could have already been in another name, pre-booked for whatever reason. And he could have been on the flight under it. Oh, just use that ticket. I don't know how much control they had over it. I mean, they weren't really saying here, show your driver's license with your thing. This is pre 9 11 by decades. Right. If you got a ticket, you got a ticket, get on, you know, handshake, what have you. So that's just a, it's just a thought that came in my mind that people like that who are, well connected, et cetera, they tend to have just bookings. You know, it's kind of like they can call up, hey, I need a jet to go such and such, or I need call a my guy. Yeah, you know, call my guy. Boom, boom, boom. There you go. So there you go. Right. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, I think that that very well could be. In terms of, you know, what's going on with Oswald's financial situation, we don't know. There's not, there truly isn't a, a way to prove it one way or the other. Uh, it kind of speaks for itself. The, it doesn't appear that he would have been able to afford all of these things. So the question is, how did he? My my dad was in the Marines around that time. And I think his salary was approximately $60 a month. Yeah. Think about that. Where are I, you going to get that money? <laughs> that's right. And for, for Oswald, uh, a lot of the money he would have earned when he was in Japan, and they were paid in military scrip. Uh, there that they use on the base mm -hmm. so um yeah it's it, it, it was it came down to like 1100 bucks and the freighter cost 400 so uh, allegedly he told uh the uh the person in london or i'm sorry yeah it, it was in london or maybe it was in somewhere else in england where he had arrived that he had like 700 dollars on him so i mean that that kind of the math sort of adds up but still 700 bucks to get you to Helsinki to you know stay at the fanciest hotels for five nights and then an all expenses paid trip through throughout Russia for you know a few weeks or whatever it was and then he didn't use all that because he ended up staying at the hotel for months so that's that's more than seven hundred bucks I think even in nineteen sixty three dollars all right the bigger the biggest thing as we wrap up Helsinki is did Oswald get help to go there and why did he choose Helsinki because Helsinki at the time was the only place in all of Europe where someone could get a, a visa to go to the Soviet Union in 24 hours. They could get it pretty much immediately as long as they proved that they had their travel accommodations within Taurus, the Soviet Travel Union. So after the assassination, the um, I should also say Oswald wrote uh, that he would be staying in Helsinki for five days when he checked into the hotel. And a normal person wouldn't know how long it would take to get there, you know, to get this paperwork done. Mm -hmm. He ended up staying for precisely five days. Uh, and, 
like I said, usually there was a variable amount of time, but he, he guessed exactly correctly. And that's, you know, that's just one little thing, but it's like, wow, good, good for him to be able to guess that so correctly. Uh, we know in 1963 that it took five to seven days to get a Soviet visa in Helsinki. And uh, it was impossible within two or three days to get a Soviet visa in, in Helsinki. And that's according to the CIA, because they actually went back and called the Soviet embassy in 1963 to figure out what was going on. But that's that's information from 1963, not 1959 when Oswald was there. So what's Make really interesting about this is that there's this document trail from uh, a Soviet consulate in Helsinki named Gregory Golub. And he's at a luncheon and he tells his you know American counterpart, the guy at the American embassy, hey, if, if you've got Americans that want to get tourist visas to come over to the Soviet Union, everywhere else in, in uh, you know all the other Soviet embassies, they have to get permission from Moscow. But as long as they have their uh, in-tourist papers and I, and I decide they're all right, then I'll approve them immediately. So then there are the State Department dispatches uh, where they're sharing this information. Hey, you know, Gregory Golub told us about this. Uh, and then and then the day before Oswald arrives, one literally one day before Oswald arrives in Helsinki, there's a State De Department dispatch talking about how two other Americans were successful in getting this immediate visa through Gregory Golub, just like he said he would do. So... Uh, you know, we saw how Oswald made up a fake reason to get out of the military early when he would have been discharged anyway in three more months. So, you know, if there's someone in the government who has a plan for Oswald, it seems like time is of the essence and they don't want to wait. You know what I mean? I keep asking this question. Why did he make up the whole ruse with his mom to get out, you know, three months early when he, he could have got out in December anyway? This would be consistent with that. Like, why does he really need to go to the Soviet Union immediately? Like, could he not wait a week, even if he's on like top secret business? But, you know, it would, it would seem time is of the essence. Or it would seem that this is just a total coincidence, huh? What a strange thing that he picked the only place where he could uh, get you know immediate approval. So, what, what's your take on that? Well, I mean, this is Oswald. Everything about Oswald is crazy. One, what is he? Twenty years old right now? Yeah, that's right. So, and he's already been a snitch for O and I. I'm calling him a snitch. You pick a different term, but <laughs> he was working with O and I um, in Japan at the time talking about, Hey, there's some, uh, commies in clubs. Let's go to the clubs. Here's the commies. So it, it is very weird. So then he gets re released early through whatever BS means with his mother, the fake, um, bit there. And he goes on. So I, I don't know. I, I'm feeling state type connections here. Like somebody being moved around in different roles already. Mm. And obviously the, um, well, he's just, such a good gambler you know he knows yeah. i i need to definitely go to helsinki got to get there um they'll take good care of me i'm curious who were the other two people was one of them webster that went to helsinki yeah for, um they had that because what a great competitive advantage no here too it, like <laughs> it, 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 it they weren't defectors they were legitimate just tourists that were getting tourist visas the other two you mentioned the Office of Naval Intelligence. I, I don't. I don't think we covered that uh, on on solving JFK. Tell tell me a little bit more if you remember about his. Um, is there a document uh, like on that uh, in terms of him uh, talking about communists? Back, yeah. yeah, I'd have to dig back into the show, but essentially, he he was while in Japan, he was going to again the top club. I believe it was in Tokyo. Queen Bee. Uh, I, I guess it is. I, I'd have to look yeah. it up. Yeah. Uh, Oswald has really, really good tastes <laughs> or had get good tastes, very expensive tastes. It seems like they seem to follow him around. So as a private, he's going into a club, a lot of officers frequent mm -hmm. in Japan. That's very, very weird. And it, it just kind of goes with this. Right. No, it, do, it does. Uh, that David Bucknell, we talked about David Bucknell, uh, was served with uh, Oswald in Santa Ana, and Oswald told him that he met this uh, Japanese woman at the Queen Bee that was asking for, you know, basically information about the U-2s. And then he told his superior, and the superior was like, you should you should sleep with her. 
and here's some money to go to the club. <laughs> and he did. <laughs> and that's that's what he told David Bucknell. So, um, you know, whether that's true or not, we'll leave it up to people to decide. But uh, but that is what David Bucknell is on the, re the record in Hustler magazine saying. <laughs> but, you know, uh, it's not not necessarily like Life magazine would would publish uh, something like that. All right. The next thing, you know, the whole suicide attempt at the Hotel Metropole in Moscow. So did he really intend suicide or was this a show suicide? That's sort of the question. Uh, the backstory is that he he's denied uh, the right to stay in the Soviet Union. You know, he says he wants to defect. They say, no, you can't stay here. So he cuts his left wrist on the day that he finds out that he has to go home now, Yuri Noshinko, who is Gerald Posner's uh, guy, he's a uh, KGB that turned uh, and became a CIA and, uh, as agent, basically. Um, he, he says that he's the one responsible for monitoring Oswald while he was in Russia. I don't know if that's true or not. And that this was a very serious suicide attempt, so serious, in fact, that it required blood transfusions. But on the other hand, Dr. Lydia Michalina, a psychiatrist at the hospital, Botkinskaya Hospital, described the injury as a show suicide since he was refused political asylum, which he had been demanding. We know that Oswald had to get four stitches as a result of the injury, and it, it was a real thing that happened. But to me, it doesn't seem like he was trying to kill himself because it, it you know, doesn't seem like it was a serious enough attempt based on what the doctors on the record say. I don't have any evidence that Yuri Nosenko was there to, to know, but we do have a doctor who was there. I think he was trying to make it seem like he really wanted to be in Russia so that the Soviets would let him stay, either because it was his job as a false defector, or you could argue because he was crazy and he just loved the Soviet Union. So <laughs> what do you think about the whole suicide attempt? Um, well, one, I, I wish I could see a diagram of how he did it. Did he want, did he cut across or did he cut lengthwise? Because that's a big difference. If he cut lengthwise, he probably would need a transfusion. Number two, uh, the length feels a little weird to me. You said, uh, what, three to five centimeters. That's 1.8 or four one, stitches. Yeah. 1.2 inches to not quite two inches, which seems not as long as you typically see uh were there hesitation marks you see there's other factors in there that i would i would question too like you know if there are hesitation marks things like that but again uh look at the results coincidentally every time he makes a move he seems to be placed in another area it it was effective right he was told to get the f out he did this and then he stayed there for how much longer Right. Yeah. That was, what was that? Uh, in Oct mid October. And then he stays there through the end of December. So he's there for a while. Yeah. So that's, yeah. Not only there, right. but then he goes on. That, well, then they send, send them to Minsk. Yeah. But, but, but this is the guy they're going to eject. So he goes from ejection to having this incident, whatever we want to call it. I'm, I'm on YouTube. I, the word suicide, you can't say on YouTube without okay. problems. <laughs> anyway. Okay. He has this incident. Good to know. <laughs> oh, trust me, I know. Um, he has this incident, and now he's going to get extended, and he gets moved. Does that make sense to you? Uh, no, it doesn't make. I mean, the argument is that the reason they let him stay there is because they didn't want to have a, uh, they didn't want to look bad that they were, you know, manhandling an American or whatever, and making him leave when he didn't want to leave. But it's like. It's the height of the Cold War. I don't think people would be surprised if you kicked an American out. I don't, you know what I mean? So, <laughs> but that's, this is what, uh, that, that's the counter argument that I read in, in a uh, case closed. So you feed him up and let him heal and send his ass home in two months. What, why would you send him to Minsk? Right. Uh, they, they, you know, they kept a close eye on him once he was there, but yeah, why send him in the first place? Unless they were, you know, it was some sort of a dangle to, do you have a theory on, on why? I, I'm not. I'm not completely certain as to why, but uh, I mean, he obviously was serving some sort of purpose for them, and that's why I get so confused about the whole thing. Because, in a weird way, and this is we're looking back at it, it almost seems like it was a transparent game. Mm -hmm. Like I can't help but go, 
How stupid were they to go, oh, yes, this really is somebody who wants to defect here. There's no intelligence stink on him. Like, sure. I, I, I interviewed Jack Barsky, who was the um, longest lived clone, um, mole in the United States. He lived here for 16 years before he was detected. These are not dumb people. They're very smart. And I'm not sure. I, I'm wondering if they just were moving him around just to see what he's going to do. Well, as we'll talk about here in just a little bit, there's a good chance that Marino was KGB. And if that's the case, perhaps they they thought, well, let's see if we can get one of ours to latch on to him to figure out what's going on. You know, that could potentially be one way the logic would match up. Oswald never really actually legally defected to his whole interaction with the U.S. Embassy in Moscow. And then there's also the strange timing of cables from the consul Richard Snyder about the you know about American defectors right before Oswald gets there. So Halloween day 1959, Lee Harvey Oswald shows up at the American embassy. He tosses his passport on the table, tells him that he's going to give all of his radar secrets that he learned in the Marines to the Soviets. And all of this was because he's a Marxist. And the other as consul one as one does. That's totally normal <laughs> behavior. Yeah, just, hey, hey, I, I want to leave and I want to give all the secrets. Yeah, I'm going to give you all my secrets. And then I'm going to I'm going to tell the people that would punish me uh, if I gave the Soviets the secrets that I'm going to do it. <laughs> That's the interesting part. But uh, the other consul, aside from Snyder McVicker, he said that he thought Oswald had been coached and that he was reciting lines that he memorized. That really jumped out to me. Uh, but three days before Oswald shows up, at the U.S. Embassy in Moscow. Snyder had sent a letter to the officer in charge of Soviet affairs at the State Department requesting advice on how to handle American defectors. He asked if he should make it easier for American defectors to get their passports back by making it so that they never legally defected in the first place. Mm -hmm. And then when Oswald shows up, that's exactly what Snyder does, that he had mentioned doing three days before. And this letter wasn't a routine letter that he would be sending all the time talking about defectors because Oswald was only the third defector in 1959, at that point in October of 1959. So Oswald did show the intent to defect. And he said, you know, the things to make it seem like, yeah, he definitely wants to defect. But because he never signed the correct document and because he visited the embassy on a Saturday when it was technically closed, which is also what Robert Webster did. Uh, he never legally defected. And oh, by the way, we know that Oswald's passport was being used by another person, which fits in precisely with all we've been talking about in terms of Oswald being in two places at the same time. And the idea that there were two Lee Harvey Oswald passports in use is why the American embassy refused to mail Oswald his passport, as we later learned from declassified documents. So any thoughts on the whole uh, saga there at the American embassy and, and uh, Snyder kind of taking the, the back door? Uh, I'm not going to actually take your defection. Let me just hold your passport for you. Um, Again, it's weird. Like who goes to the um, embassy, by the way, and says, I am going to spill every secret that I've learned from top secret base in Japan. I want to leave and I want to tell them everything. What do you say? Can you help right. me out. That makes no sense. Unless, like you said, it's scripted, right? Right. This is the U.S. Embassy. Was it bugged? Did they think they were bugged? Could it be a factor of, hey, you're going to spout off this story, so then that way the Soviets can listen through the bug, which they put on a Saturdays because it's easier to get in, whatever it is, and then they will hear this little canned story, and they'll say, oh, I'm a big sucker. He must really want to give us lots of secrets, or let me ask him secrets about his time in Japan. I don't know. This is me throwing wild speculation out there, but it just, nothing makes sense. Nothing makes sense. So in other words, Oswald's performance wasn't for the American consuls. It was for the uh, the Soviets who were listening. That's I've read that a lot, and I've heard people say that, and I think that's Definitely plausible. Or so, people who work there. Right. You know, I mean, did they hire local talent? I mean, because there's staff 
people that they might might have hired that were Soviet citizens, for all I know. I don't know if everybody at the console was, in fact, American or not. There's, um, They did hire Soviet citizens, and I know that because one person who went on to work at the uh, American embassy was Ella German, who, who Oswald dated. So There you go. So now you can't tell me that the KGB wouldn't have their hooks into anybody who might work at the embassy. Or sure. The Especially if they, that's true, if they were a Soviet citizen. All right, next issue. Let's talk about Robert Webster. Did Robert Webster have intelligence ties? What was going on with Robert Webster? Robert Webster was a plastics expert who worked for the Rand Development Company at the time of his defection, and he ultimately defected to the Soviet Union. This company, Rand Development, was uh, founded by Henry Rand, who worked at the Office of Strategic Services, or the OSS, which was the CIA's predecessor during World War II. George Bookbinder was also a top executive of the company, and he also worked for the OSS, and he reported directly to Frank Wisner, who was one of the founders of the CIA. Uh, On top of that, Christopher Byrd, who was working for the CIA at the time, served as the Washington, D.C. representative for RAND development in the 1950s. So in other words, there are clear connections between RAND development and the CIA during the time when Robert Webster defected to Russia. That doesn't prove that the CIA used RAND development, but it does mean that they could have. Mm -hmm. Uh, Webster went to a trade show in Russia for RAND development, basically just showing off new technology. This is in 1959, and he defected while he was there. One thing that I always thought was just crazy, when Webster went to the Soviet uh, Office for, of Visas and Registrations, where he actually went to go defect, he was accompanied there by his bosses, Henry Rand and George Bookbinder, the two guys that had the OSS ties, and also Richard Snyder from the U.S. Embassy. So that's, I mean, maybe that's normal, but that felt strange. Why would they care? Why would they go? Why would they help him? Um, that didn't make a ton of sense to me. Uh, oh, I mean, <laughs> plastics, baby, <laughs> plastics. They wanted to get the word out about plastics in, Ru- in, in Russia. I don't try know. Try my product. You got to try my product. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, you know, that's one more thing of like, does, I don't, I don't know. That doesn't make sense to me. That, that see, it seems like, you know, these two guys with intelligence ties and the actual, oh, Snyder, of course, was CIA. He was part of, um, uh, Operation Project Redskin, where they took legal travelers, and it's actually Project Redskin is one of the more innocent CIA projects that I've ever heard of. <laughs> they just they got people who are already going uh, abroad to Soviet Un- Union in particular, and they said, "Hey, tell us some stuff when you get back. You know, I want you to, when you go over there, I want you to look at this for us." It's like, okay, well, so Donovan, that, um, yeah. Donovan and his people at the OSS. There, there's a tradition beforehand of. Germany and whatever, like, hey, give me all your vacation photos. Give me all right. that. I, I didn't know if you knew that, but that that kind of was a preceding tradition that, hey, they're already there. They're already talking to people. They're already taking pictures. Let's sure. look at their vacation photos. Let's learn about the culture. How do things work? How do they shop? Whatever. But no, it's weird. What you're right. saying is weird. Um, we can't say definitively Robert Webster was tied to the CIA, but his bosses sure were. Sure. Well, Webster told author Dick Russell that he met Marina Prusakova at this trade show in Moscow right around the time when he defected. And that when he met her, she spoke English to him because he didn't speak any Russian. Uh, She also met with Webster again about a year later in Leningrad. This is what Webster says. And based on Marina has a notebook that has the address of the person that she says that she stayed with in Leningrad. And it's like four or five apartments numbers down from Robert Webster's apartment in the same apartment building. And Webster says that he saw her at that time. So that all does check out. And the question is just why? And we'll talk more about Marina here in a second. But later on in Dallas, Marina will tell uh, Katya Ford, one of the white Russians in Dallas, that the way that she met Oswald was at a trade show in Moscow. Uh, but she was really confusing Oswald with meeting Robert Webster. And this is what Katya Ford told the Warren Commission this. So, I mean, that's that is crazy. I think it definitively proves that Marina did meet Robert Webster. And then you have to ask why, which we'll get to here when we talk about Marina. 
But Webster never admitted, this is what I was saying before, he never admitted to being a double agent. He may have been used by intelligence, which is, you know, the thing with his two bosses and the console going. So maybe they had a use for him and he didn't know about it. But uh, I know that uh, there's a book by a guy named Gary Hill who uh, who looks at Webster and after doing a, a, a deep dive, he ends up concluding that uh, Webster was not actually intelligent. Webster came back in 1961, and uh, yeah, that's that's pretty much it. He he came back uh, to to America, and and he wasn't shunned by his very conservative community for uh, for defecting to communism at the height of the Cold War, which was interesting. Yeah, well, they made it very easy. It's like a revolving door for defectors. I don't know uh, about Robert Webster ultimately, but the the Marina angle of it is what's super interesting on it. So let, let's go to Marina, and just the big question: Was Marina KGB? And I this is something I learned a, a lot going through this. I thought the whole Marina being KGB was maybe one of those you know you know the in the JFK case. There's some things that are even on the conspiracy side, they're they're very mainstream. They're pretty rock solid. You got a lot of evidence for it, okay? But then there's some things maybe you only have one or two pieces of evidence for, and they're kind of, kind of out there further that maybe more of a jump. And I didn't know, you know, maybe where exactly Marina as KGB fit in for that. But after studying this, Marina as KGB is, is one of the strongest things we have evidence for, I think. Um, it, the CIA has a memo that lists 29 reasons why Marina may be KGB. So if the CIA itself has this 29 bullet point memo, that is that's really something. Then we have uh, the memo from Thomas Kasason warning about Soviet women marrying foreigners and then getting divorces when they return to the foreigner's home country and staying in the country as a Soviet sleeper agent after they're divorced. And Kasason said that he wanted to warn Oswald, but he didn't have a chance to actually speak to him. He wrote this memo a couple of days after the assassination, and he was he was looking back to the 1960s when he wrote the memo. Turns out Kasason was actually a pseudonym for a real CIA officer named Jacques Richardson. But uh, at any rate, uh, just some more, more reasons why Marina may be KGB. Look at the people that she was involved with. Okay, so, all right, so she dated Oswald. You know, obviously, she married Oswald, left the country with him. And, you know, I think there's a real question as to what was he tied to intelligence, but mm-hmm. certainly he, he was an American. She dated a Moroccan exchange student, Mohamed Ragab, uh, who actually went on to become a famous Moroccan film director. He's got his own Wikipedia page, so that's kind of cool that <laughs> Marina's ex-boyfriend became this director. But this, you know, again, this guy from Morocco, then she she sought out Robert Webster. She said that she often entertained foreign dignitaries and she alleged that she was raped by the ambassador of, of uh, Afghanistan. So uh, which was then that testimony was stricken uh, at the HSCA, which is is interesting. I don't know why. And then also the man that Marina told the Warren Commission is the person who introduced her to Oswald at this trade union dance. His name is Yuri Marizhensky. He says that Marina had to leave Leningrad because of prostitution with foreigners at Hotel Leningrad. So when you put all that together, you know, given that there is this program, whatever you want to call it, a a honeypot program or whatever, you know, that's a thing. We know that's a thing. It seems like Marina's behavior matches that. What are the chances that she would interact with two of the three American defectors, you know, in different places in such a huge country in such a short period of time? So your thoughts on Marina as KGB? Oh, I, I think it it's it's it smells like it for sure. It's like mm-hmm. quacks like a duck. But um, the other thing I think is interesting is the parallels with uh, Marina and Oswald, especially for language. Because you have Oswald supposedly in Russia never being able to speak any uh, Russian at all, only English, especially when he was staying you know, at the high-end hotels. You have Marina who liked to also stay at high-end hotels, by the way. I mean, they both have you know, very rich tastes. And then Marina coming to the States supposedly couldn't speak any English at all. That's uh, Ruth Payne was going to help uh, learn. I, I, I just think it's kind of funny because both of them seem to struggle with the other language at different points in the different mm-hmm. countries, depending on whom you're speaking to and at convenient points. No, absolutely. And so, the, you know, the question for that would be why? I mean, if Oswald took all this time to learn Russian, he passed a Russian language test when he was in the military. 
why would he take all that time and then not use the skill in the, you know, like, why would you learn Spanish and then go to, go to Mexico or Spain and not use it? <laughs> like that's nonsensical. It makes no, unless you're, it's so good <laughs> that you don't want to be detected, uh, 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 you know, and it looks like, you know, you would be a, a double agent or whatever. So that's, that's the art. That's the argument John Armstrong makes. He says, you know, Oswald's a double agent. He wants to hide how good his Russian is. That's why he's not speaking Russian. We know that Oswald can speak Russian, but that, that's not debated. The bigger question mark it, for him, it's like, oh, that's weird. That's weird. That he's not. I wonder why. With Marina, it's you know, it was rock solid that she spoke only Russian. She didn't speak English because one of the big reasons in Posner's book that you know Har Lee Harvey Oswald is such a bad guy is because Marina wants to learn English and he refuses. He insists that she you know not be allowed to learn English. But if she could speak English the whole time, and also what language did they communicate in? If he if he didn't speak Russian and she didn't speak English, well, supposedly, and I don't know remember the source of it, but um. Marina has stated that she had confused his accent. Like his Russian was so good that um, she thought he could have been from Belarus or something, you know, like not proper Russia, but you know, when Polish, I thought something like that, but it, yeah. Yeah, it was, it was very, very, very good. Just kind of like um, a regional thing. Right. So speak. So let's, let, let's get to that. Let's get to Marina and Lee's marriage, which was fun. Like in my, uh, podcast episode on this i got to to drop the information to to all everybody who listens out there that my grandma got married for a piano oh. <laughs> to a to a guy she met on a bus so he she was leaving home and she said i just want a piano and he said i'll buy you a piano if you marry me and she said deal so that's why i was like i can't you know my, my grandparents were probably both spies i would imagine <laughs> but <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But anyway, so the, the point is people do get together in weird ways. And I would hesitate to, you know, criticize, uh, you know, the way people get together. But it's also true that some things are very implausible. OK, so so let's talk about how Marina and Lee got together. So the, it's very fast and, and the story is inconsistent. And to me, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Supposedly, they met on March 25th at a trade union dance and then they got engaged in the hospital uh, just in time to file a marriage request uh, permit on April 10th and they were never alone once before they were engaged and it's even weird that they would get that far so the official story again is they they met on March 25th they're engaged what like two weeks later and Oswald's in the hospital the whole the whole time of that that two week period getting his tonsils taken out and recovering from it so the official story on the night they met is that Oswald lost out to another guy uh, when he met Marina. So Oswald and five other guys, this is according to his diary, leave the dance with Marina. And then she leaves uh, the group with one of the other guys and takes a cab somewhere else. So she leaves him the first night they meet, but he gets her number. And then when he's in the hospital, having his tonsils removed, he calls her and apparently she comes to visit him. And in that period when he's in the hospital, we know because they have had to file a uh, request to get married on and they did that on April 10th. You know, that's that's when their relationship happens. But Marina tells three different stories about meeting Oswald. One is that she met him at the dance. Another is that she got to know him at this person's house. That was like an after party after the dance. And then the other one is uh, in the hospital. So it's kind of all over the place. And this official story that I just talked about is mostly from Oswald's diary. And we'll talk about that here in a little bit. There are real questions of credibility surrounding that. Mm -hmm. You know, my ultimate opinion on, on Marina is that because I think she was likely KGB and it was her job to marry a foreigner, just like Thomas Cassison was warning about in his memo, I think her plan was to divorce Oswald when she got back to the States and to try to obtain citizenship there and, you know, maybe be a Soviet sleeper agent. To me, that seems plausible given this behavior. Um, I don't know why he married her. You know, who, who knows? It, it really is hard to say. I will say she was a pretty she's pretty. She's oh, yeah. an attractive, attractive girl, no doubt about it. But if she only spoke Russian and he didn't speak any Russian, then like we were just talking about, how could they possibly have communicated? And we know that he didn't speak Russian. A, a lot of the witnesses there say that. But Anna Zeiger, who uh, that's the house where Oswald would be three or four nights a week. He was at the Zeiger home. 
And she said they never once saw him speak Russian and her father would always translate. So, yeah, I mean, just thoughts on how Marina and Lee got together. I guess, do you think it was a credible, real relationship or was it, you know, we know why she would want him if it's the KGB angle, but I still am not clear on why he would marry her unless he just really liked her. I don't know. Like, how does that fit into the operation? I don't know. I don't know. It's a, it's another mystery. Like, um, I, I think about the parallel with Webster who also married only difference is that Webster left his and Oswald brought her. Right. So I, I, I don't, I mean, is it possible that uh, both were marriages for whatever reason? I hate to say of convenience, but it could be, I don't know. Like um, there are many soldiers who get married for the benefits in the military, the same way as, Marino would want to get married to get a green card to come over here. Well, his marrying her over there would also help solidify his stay for a while. And maybe the same thing with Webster. Only Webster said, well, you know what? I'm out of here. I don't care. I'm just going back home. You can stay there. And I'm not trying to judge him or whatever. It's just that that relationship served its course. Whereas Oswald, who knows, maybe he's saying, oh, my God, I have a child here. And I actually want that child to come with me. And, well, I guess I better bring the mother, too. <laughs> yeah i'm not trying to yeah. be rude I, I, i'm just it's hard to speculate because i'm like there's got to be some real emotions and real feelings and thoughts in this mix right yes i agree i think I, I agree with that but yeah that that that's i guess maybe that's one we'll never know but it is a question to be asked once you're aware of all the the different information out there next topic why did the cia not open a 201 file on oswald when they were already following his mail for ht lingual so in November of 1959, Oswald is the subject of this program called HT Lingual, which was a joint program between the CIA, the FBI, and the post office. And he's one of 300 Americans who's sending mail to or from the Soviet Union or China that is having their mail read. Now, what historians who have specialized in the CIA records, like John Newman and Jefferson Morley say, is that... It doesn't make sense that the CIA would know more about Oswald through HT Lingual. Like they know that he's over there in the Soviet Union. They know that he's over there in the Soviet Union, but then to not create a 201 file on him until more than a year later. So there's 13 months between when they start reading his mail for HT Lingual and when they actually open the 201 file. And a 201 is a routine file that's created on any person of interest. You know, um, it, it is true that it says in the CIA operations manual that uh, 201 can be opened at any time. It's not required to be opened immediately. But the practice was to open one as soon as there was, you know, a person of interest and you, you thought they would be a person of interest. And we know this because when CIA director Richard Helms was told by the HSCA about this 13 month delay in creating the 201 file, his response was, quote, I'm amazed. Are you sure? So he didn't even believe that that was the case. You know, it seemed like it was off to him. And another thing that we learned from this, uh, you know, from the HSCA is that there were files that were collected about Oswald in the 13 month period of time uh, in between when they opened the HT Lingual uh, investigation on him. And when the 201 was open, so there's files, they existed. And so the HSCA said, where are those files? And the CIA's response was that those files had all been destroyed. <laughs> so that was, that was another one of those. Oh, okay. So those are gone right on. Um, and I will say, you know, the delay in opening the 201 file is weird, but the delay alone is not enough to show that Oswald was CIA connected. I think a lot of the other things we're talking about, we put them all together. Perhaps that does, mm -hmm. but, uh, there's I want to mention one important thing that I didn't cover in my episode that I'm going to come back to in depth in the future, but it's kind of relevant right now. And that is uh, the idea of the routing of Oswald's 201 file within different divisions in the CIA. So long story short, the 201 was handled by the Special Investigations Group, which was James Angleton's office, when it should have been handled by the Soviet Russia Division, which is that's who's handling everything, you know, out of Russia. 
So this is probably as close to a smoking gun as there is to show that Oswald was connected to the CIA. The fact that his file bypassed Soviet Russia division and went straight to the, the special investigations group. We haven't really covered that in depth on, on this show, but we will uh, in the future. And yeah, the, the 201 is a really interesting area to look into. So any, any thoughts on that, Eric? I, I mean, my thoughts are myriad because I'm, I'm still kind of learning as I go a little bit, but one, Mark, I'm always going to defer to Mark because he's so deep into it. And he's always stressing. Everybody goes CIA, 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 CIA with Oswald. Oswald's O and I. Hmm. Now, how do we know this? Well, we have the ties with the intelligence. And also he made the phone call to North Carolina. Was that phone call to North Carolina when he was in the prison to CIA? No, it was to O and I. So I think there. this is part of the reason you might have this weird disconnect but connect these departments typically like fbi doesn't share with cia and vice versa quite often the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is necessarily doing angleton could have been running an operation with o and i i mean how many people were qualified to actually be sent into the soviet union who could speak very good russian who would just throw everything away you're literally counting them on one hand right so sure. there's not that many people and that's very public. There's newspapers, there's press clippings, things like that. So you have one agency, you said the postmaster and whoever else is tied in with it. Well, you kind of had to monitor his mail. Otherwise, I, wouldn't it look even weirder if you said, oh, don't worry about his mail. Sure, Just worry yeah. about these other fellows' mail who are in the so Because he was there, right. So that I, it's not right. surprising, well, yeah. I'm saying that this is why maybe there's this weird mix up where one thing yeah his males monitor with the other 300 people because you, you can't really get around that you can't hide the fact there's a small number of people it's going to draw you know raise eyebrows if you don't monitor the dude but then when it comes to the agency's actual file that they open angleton's involved and mm. it, yeah i know about it we're not, we're not bothering the file and helms may not have even known at the time like that could have been legitimately a surprise to him because sure. procedurally speaking, they would do that. How does he know if one of his top, top people mm -hmm. underneath is actually doing that? We don't know. Right. Nope. So the, the Naval intelligence thing, um, yeah, I'm interested in that. I'd like to learn more about that. The, the Raleigh call, and I'm forgetting the guy's name off the top of my head. I, I, we, we covered that in, in depth and we covered both sides of it. And there was the, the big thing is that the guys got military intelligence ties in World War II, but it wasn't military intelligence. You're saying it was naval intelligence specifically. Oh, wow. And Oswald was calling his ONI naval intelligence contact. Okay, good. This is like one of the premises of the show is that I don't know everything. I am trying, I am looking at primary sources and trying to find as much as I can, but there are big gaps. So this, you know, the, the ONI side of things is certainly, I'm going to put that on the board to, uh, to, to do a deeper dive on. I appreciate that, Eric. No, when um, Japan too, if you go back to it, just ONI is all. Yeah. Different. Yeah, we did. I did a pretty deep dive on Japan. And I think I, I may, I may be cross-referencing some of the same things you're talking about and some of the same people, but, but if there's anything I'm missing, uh, yeah, you guys send, send me your ONI stuff. I'd love to see it. Uh, all right. So let's go to, so that we talked on HT Lingual and the 201 file. Let's talk about Otto Otepka. You know much about Otto Otepka? You ever heard his story? I'm going to lean into you for this. Okay. All right. Otto Otepka was the head of the State Department Office of Security. And he realized that there's this uptick in Americans defecting to Russia. And he knew that the Soviets had a program of trying to send false defectors over to America. So he assumed that some of these defections uh, that were going over to the Soviet Union were not genuine and were sponsored by you know, our intelligence agencies. So he reached out to the CIA and provided a list of defectors and asked them which ones were CIA so that he could avoid stepping on their toes. And here's where it gets interesting. Within the CIA, this research project, we have the declassified sort of document trail to where the research project went. And within the CIA, it skipped over the Soviet Russia division, just like it did with his 201 file. Skipped over the Soviet Russia division, that's the one that really should have, have had the information, and went straight to the Office of Security and to James Angleton, the head of counterintelligence. 
eventually a staffer in the office of security was given the the task of researching these 18 names but her boss a guy named paul gainer told her specifically to not research seven names she gave him a list of or he gave her a list of seven names and on that list sure enough was lee harvey oswald <laughs> so, so he's a lucky guy He's so lucky. So the CIA sabotaged their own internal research project by intentionally not looking into Oswald. Now, I can't think of a good reason for them to not work with, you know, the State Department Office, Office of Security in good faith, unless those seven names or some of those seven names were extremely top secret. Uh, that's that's a strange one to me. So what gets crazier is after that incident, Otto Otepka, the guy that kind of started this this you know ball rolling on this line of inquiry he loses his uh security clearances and then he has his safe broken into in his office and we find out later that it was broken into by his boss and that safe had all the documents that he was working on for the research project for these defectors the, the ones that oswald was involved in and then uh later down the road he's fired from the state department three weeks before the assassination and then he comes forward and says that he knows who killed Kennedy. And when the reporter gets him on the record, then he says he doesn't want to talk about it anymore. So that's the story of Otto Otepka. Um, thoughts? <laughs> um, uh, it, it sounds like every other story dealing with Oswald. I, I mean, it, it, that is crazy. And it's typical that there's a special treatment for Oswald. Wherever he goes, there's a special treatment. Yeah, the the only counter argument I can put together for why the Otto Otepka story doesn't look like Oswald was intelligence is maybe there was somebody else on the list of seven and the CIA included Oswald as like one of the dummy ones that didn't matter. And maybe maybe only three of the seven mattered and Oswald wasn't one of those. But again, but like, what are that. the chances of this? What are the chances of that and all the other things combined? That's that's what I struggle with. So yeah, it's a big struggle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Two more topics. Uh, let's talk about the historic diary. Uh, are you familiar with this historic diary while he was in Russia? There's this, this it's whole... a diary smuggled out, right? Under his clothes to come back here or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Well, actually, we don't know the providence of it. We don't know where it came from hmm. precisely. It can't it got into the world, into the record as we know it, through Hugh Ainsworth, who's this uh like CIA, CIA affiliated reporter. When I say CIA affiliated, he he worked on some specific projects for them in the past. Doesn't mean he was an agent, but but he certainly had the connections. Um, let's talk about this Oswald's historic diary. So there are a ton of indiscrepancies that are in the diary versus things that we know for sure. And I, I outlined all these in the fourth episode of the series towards the very end. We go in detail on all these discrepancies. Um, but the biggest one to me is he's in the hospital for two weeks. And this is the period of time when between when he meets Marina and when he's engaged to marry her. And he has two diary entries about Marina, but he doesn't mention at all that he's in the hospital. How how would you write diary entries from a hospital and not mention at all that you were in the hospital? Or And he actually never mentions having his tonsils out and being in the hospital for two weeks as he's writing these diaries. So I, to me, that jumped out as being a little weird. Are there entries missing or there are entries for the days when he's there and it, it, it covers the days when he's there, but he doesn't talk about the hospital hmm. at all or reference it in any way. So it's, it's pretty, I thought that stuck out. The Warren report says that everything that was in the diary before Minsk, he wrote in one sitting, basically once he read it, made it to Minsk, he wrote everything that had happened before, you know, when he was in Moscow. And then after that, he was writing in real time. That's the Warren Report's position. The HSCA had their handwriting experts look at this document, and they they were able to match it with some other writings that were believed to be from Oswald. So in other words, you know, there's pretty good evidence that it was in Oswald's handwriting. But also they, they universally agreed, these experts, that the diary was written in one sitting. Hmm. So if that's, that's the believable. case, I mean, that, that is something that can be 
determined just by yeah. the flow right. and the ink drying. You know, there, there typically would be some stutter stop type of situation. Um, I don't know though. One sitting, there's one way that could be legitimate and also weird. Is there? Is it possible he could have transcribed uh, another diary? Like, you know, okay, you you have a diary, you have X number of pages, right? Mm -hmm. Let's say you filled up a notebook, that's full, but now you got a bigger notebook. And so you're like, sure. well, let me just go ahead and whoa, jot down everything from this first one because I'm not going to have like a stack of diaries. I'm having to, you know, travel around and smuggle it under my shirt. So I've got to move the information here. It's just a random thought that as a way that you could do it in one sitting and it could still be legitimately multiple um, dates that it had entries prior. That makes a lot of sense. No, you, what you're saying is instead of like carrying around a bunch of scraps from a bunch of different days, they just wanted to consolidate what he already had, basically. Yeah. Okay. No, that that makes a lot of sense. Um, but we really don't know how the like I was saying, we really don't know how the document made its way into evidence. Hugh Ainsworth found it, and you know, like I said, he may potentially have CIA ties because he had worked with the CIA on some things when he traveled before and just sort of, you know, told them about what he saw. So it's not like he was working closely with, with CIA, but, but uh, it came from Hugh Ainsworth. So we really don't know because he never, he never told people about the provenance of it. He, he you know, he just, he's never gone deep on exactly where it came from. So if it was by Oswald, it was in one sitting. I mean, what you just told me, what you just said actually does, changed my mind a little bit about the reliability of it because if it was it could have been consolidated from other ones so potentially it's not uh you know totally unreliable but there are still all the discrepancies with all the dates and all the other things the only other known information you know right and that that's part of why i randomly came up with it because could the dates have been smeared and the dates and times got mixed up or or whatever when he was transferring? I don't know. It, it just right. it, yeah. Otherwise, it's like why? Why would you bother writing? It, it, that just makes no sense either. Why sit there and go? Well, do, 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 do. Let, let me write a quick summation of my time so far. My favorite thing in his diary is the part where he goes. He talks about this one girl he dated, Nelia, and um and how uh she's. She he said she was frighteningly large, and then he said, and then he said, uh, basically, like her passions in bed are bigger than her size. Uh, and then he goes, he goes, a fact to be to be learned after a great amount of research. <laughs> I thought that was hilarious. That's so funny, dude. But anyway, so he's the guy. By the way, what you just described—that's a pretty clever turn of phrase, and um shows a great deal of intelligence everything does this is the same guy that bill o'reilly if you looked at his interview with tucker carlson he said that oswald was a a rube who could barely put words together and, and right. this this is the kind of thing that makes you suspect it all because he's obviously incredibly intelligent he's in, involved with the optical program technically the b-52 stuff things like this is not an idiot. How the hell did he pick up an entire language? What you just described, the turn of phrase, if everybody agrees he wrote it one way or another, whether it was a ruse or not, that's still very intelligent. Right. Um, yeah, he, he, I guess, yeah, you know, so sometimes he was a little, a little witty. So there you go. Uh, all right. Last, so the big, the big overall question that I kind of handed to at the beginning is, you know, was Oswald a false defector? Did he go to the Soviet Union because he was a Marxist and he wanted to live the Soviet way of life? Or was he a false defector? Here are the, the facts that I re rely on that, that, you know, influence me towards my answer. He chooses Helsinki, which was the only place to get a 24 hour Soviet visa his travels are far above his means the whole time he's on this trip. Uh, he doesn't speak much Russian, if any, in the Soviet Union, which makes no sense unless he's trying to not be detected by the KGB. He had help at the highest levels of the INS to appeal Marina's denial of getting a visa. Uh, the CIA had this delay in opening his 201 file. The whole Otto Otepka saga that we talked about, which, is, again, is not mentioned at all in Case Closed or Reclaiming History. 
the routing of Oswald's 201 file around the Soviet Russia division of CIA, which we haven't covered yet, but it's something that can't be explained. Remember, Albert Schweitzer College, it was started by a guy who the New York Times said was a big CIA finance man. So <laughs> this, this would all you know tie in. Why is Oswald applying to that school? Gary Bucknell, uh, Oswald's colleague in the Marines in Santa Ana talked about Oswald and, and him both working with the CIA and also James Batelho, who served as well with Oswald and the Marines said that he believed Oswald was on assignment for American intelligence. Oswald's mom told the state department that he was a secret agent. <laughs> and then they, they turned around and said, ma'am, he was not, you're, you're mistaken. <laughs> but uh, then we have former CIA officer, Victor Marchetti, telling the HSCA that the Office of Naval Intelligence had an operation that was actively attempting to place false defectors in the Soviet Union as spies. Oh, and so I. The, oh, that's the one you're talking about. Yeah. And we have former CIA finance officer James Wilcott, who told the HSCA that he personally dispersed money to Oswald for the Oswald Project and that Oswald was a false defector who was sent to the Soviet Union by the CIA. Now, you know, Wilcott, uh, part of what he talks about is things that he heard other people say. Part of what he talks about is what he personally did dispersing the funds. Um, but the HSCA found that Wilcott was not uh, believable. But the HSCA's determination that they were going to throw out what he was saying was because the CIA's Soviet Russia division said Oswald was not a spy and they had no information on him. Of course they didn't. They kept getting bypassed. So to me, that that makes Wilcott's story check out more. Plus, there's the whole why do this. But no, but seriously, like all these people that say that, you know, um, any, any witness that says that, you know, there's a conspiracy and uh, that they're just making it up. It's like, actually, there's usually a more cost to to coming forward with the story than there is value to someone in coming forward with the story in many of these instances. But your your thoughts on whether Oswald was a false defector? Um, I'm lazy. I'll just do it in one. He, in fact, and by law, was a false defector. Simply by the fact he never renounced his citizenship officially. Sure. So technically, every single thing falls on its face. He never left the United States. He never left his citizenship. That was arranged. So every premise beyond is false. Correct? Sure. Yes, that's true. Literally, yes. So I'll just go with that. He's a false defector just by the facts. Do you think he had intelligence ties? Of course he did. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I mean, let me ask you this question. What What is your best argument if you had to play devil's advocate? What's the best, like, under what scenario is, Os the, you know, all the facts we talked about today, what's the scenario where Oswald's not intelligence? You know, I'm just, like just trying to give a good faith hearing to that argument. Um, the, it would be that each to me, it would be that each of these instances we talked about truly was a coincidence. Each one coincidence, each one independently is a coincidence would have to be your argument. Right. Mm -hmm. the, um, so well, uh, there is one other way that it could be, but intelligence involvement still there. If he was literally a patsy. He literally was somebody that they knew was doing this and they just kept an eye on him and just followed him around. That mm -hmm. that would be the only way I can think of that he wasn't, in fact, working with them is if they were just saying, okay, here's this idiot. He's going to go to the Soviet Union. Let's just put a tail on him. Let's just monitor him. It doesn't make sense. I'm not saying it's a great argument, but that's the only way I can think of because there's no possible way. Again, there's it's too. I grew up in the Cold War. I'm 53. People, I don't think people now understand exactly how locked down things were. I mean, this is when there was a Berlin Wall you know, just right. being built. And what do they have there? They had rifles. They shot people going one way or another. It's, it, it wasn't just a, oh, let's go take a plane trip and go show up. Hell no. Every plane going into Russia is going to be monitored every step of the way. Every single thing that was going on was being watched from both sides. 
So yeah. there had to be intelligence one way or another. Most likely he was working with them just because of how everything was greased. But, um, well, and then also the fact he never, the citizens never announced. That right there, that to me is, yeah. I, I could take everything you said and the fact that this happened with both him and Webster, I think that's the silver bullet. That's the nail in the coffin. Yeah. Yeah. It, it looks, uh, you know, anybody that, that takes the position that, you know, he was just going over there uh, as a tourist, given all the information we talked about, it, hit me up, make, make your argument. I, I'd love to see it in, in good faith. I'm not, I promise I'm not trying to be a jerk. Uh, all right. Well, Eric, again, appreciate your time today. That's we, we've gone through the Soviet union, uh, on this podcast, we'll next be jumping into – I've covered a lot of the boring stuff that uh, the, I think is important, but it, it's not sort of the most famous stuff, probably because it's not really in, in the movie JFK. It's, you know, Oswald's a kid, Oswald and the Marines, uh, Oswald in Russia. But now we're getting back into uh, into like uh, George de Mornschild land here when, when we come back. I so it's yeah oh all the fun stuff you know but warren show ruth Payne, the white russians all the stuff going on in new orleans so it's about to get it's about to get fun what you, you want to uh, let everybody know kind of where they can go to uh to to hear all your projects i just look up my name i mean eric hunley I, honestly so yeah so they can uh people can people should definitely listen to america's untold stories as it pertains to uh jfk information and uh, check out check out all of eric's uh podcasts on youtube and are, are you also in the podcast uh World Not really, or... uh, primarily YouTube. Mostly YouTube. A lot of people do listen to it, but yeah, I, I, I seldom um, update anything for the uh, All right. RSS. All right. Well, check out Eric on YouTube. And uh, Eric, once again, man, I really do appreciate you coming on Solving JFK. Thanks for having me. All right, man. Thanks a lot. For transcripts, sources, and official podcast merchandise, Visit SolvingJFKPodcast.com. In Dallas, Texas, three shots were fired at President Kennedy's motorcade in downtown Dallas. The flash, apparently official, President Kennedy died at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time. Thanks for listening. Visit SolvingJFKPodcast.com for more information. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just,